It's good to see you this morning. It's good to see, it's good to see you too. It's been a while. It has been a while. I missed chatting with you. Yeah, yeah, me too. So I had this idea um, because a lot of people have asked me questions about like, they want to see me in tandem with a counselor or a licensed therapist or something like that. And I always um, encourage that because I think having a team of mental health, you know, a mental health team is better than just going to one person so you can get multiple perspectives. So I kind of um, came up with a bunch of questions about not necessarily you, but um, you and your counseling so that I can put this on a YouTube channel or even just send it to my clients so that they can kind of get to know what they should be looking for in a counselor, what what can counselors do, um, and just know a little bit more because no one really knows how to pick out a counselor or a therapist mm -hmm. unless you usually take a reference from a friend. It can be kind of challenging for sure to pick somebody out. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I appreciate the questions that you sent over and it can be a little daunting. I can imagine like going to the psychology today page and doing a search and then getting, you know, 500 people and then, okay, what, what do I do now? It's terrifying because they have all this sort of information. They're like, I'm a cognitive behavioral therapist. I'm a family counselor. I do this. I do that. It's like, well, I don't know what I need. So, you know, how do I, how do I progress from here? But uh, I guess the first question that I wanted to ask you um, is uh, how did you get into this line of work? Um, I know that you had a different job before and that this became your passion within the last couple of years. And um, just kind of like to know like what got you into this? What made you make the change? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's a good question. And I think I had to think about that quite a bit in there. I'm in the professional world uh people come to me for advice quite often you know career advice or family or something like that and i noticed that you know i was also very comfortable or uncomfortable in some of these environments so i wanted to kind of learn more about the whys of that like what was it and then what what made all these interactions so uncomfortable and then yet if I could externalize it or step back, then I could see the dynamics and I was able to help other people work through the dynamics. So it's kind of a combination of really enjoying the coaching aspect and also being really curious about what was going on in the world, what was going on with people. Um, and I wanted to just investigate that. And I like to learn and I'm always trying to figure out how to improve human performance or or people's lives, like what makes people um, engage, activated, where's that switch that turns them on so that they can step out of some of the things that are holding them back and focus on moving forward and enjoying and uh, really living fully as opposed to being in pain or anxiety or depression. <clears throat> Yeah. yeah. It sounds like a very similar um, situation as like mine and quite a few other people is where um, the first thing you said was, you know, I already have people coming to me for advice about work and about, you know, their relationships and all, you know, this anxiety. Um, I think a lot of people who go into the counseling field or the life coaching or any sort of mental health field they're often people who have already been doing this for their friends and their family and the people that they care about. And they've turned that passion into something that um, is more of a business that is more sustainable for the individual as well as whoever they're helping. Yeah. And I, it's, I mean, it's kind of a calling and a passion at the same time, because it's, it's the kind of thing that I feel like, I, I do for free anyway, and I would do for free, and I do a lot of pro bono work and just kind of natural helping and then seeing the fruits of planting seeds and helping people grow and removing removing obstacles. Uh, 
it's really rewarding. So it has, it has its own reward. It is. It is very rewarding. One of my favorite um, instances is when I connect some dots for some people or I give them information, they go, oh my gosh, that's why that happened. <laughs> and you can see the relief in their body and they're just like, oh, that's so nice to actually have a name for that or understand what's actually going on. Um, it's, it's a very rewarding feeling for sure. So um, with your counseling, like what, what kind of counseling do you do? Do you have any specific methods that you prefer? Well, I think that you know, I try to kind of go broad and, and do what we say that we can do any kind of counseling, but really I don't have experience with like eating disorders or heavy addictions. And I would say that it's just in general, mental health counseling is heavily related to anxiety and depression and, you know, social anxiety and uh, really how people are thinking about themselves on a day-to-day -day basis and having the negative thoughts that hold them back from doing and being the things that they want to in their life and, and from their relationships being rewarding. Uh, a lot of relationships are challenging. So do a lot of relationship work with people and then methods are really <clears throat> they're like tools so the end is the goal of the client and we try to em employ or deploy methods in without dogma so in in a specific situation and that's one of the things that i really enjoy is that creativity and autonomy to help people solve their problems using whatever specific method or intervention comes to mind at the time to solve that specific problem. So trying not to be dogmatic about it. And um, so I, like it taking an integrative approach, being creative, but I have been trained in EMDR and uh, a therapy called Team CBT. And then I've done some work in um, internal family systems. And recently I've started deploying some positive psychology homework for clients, which I really enjoy and, and doing that for myself too. Uh, so positive psychology is a lot of <clears throat> fun. Obviously it's positive, so that helps. And my, <laughs> one of my go-to lines is, you know, what is the probability that you would have at least as good a result thinking positively about this problem as you would have thinking negatively. And most people can understand that the odds are that they might feel better and get at least as good a result thinking positively about whatever's going on as uh, having their negative thoughts dominate their thinking process. So yeah, so so integrated methods and really enjoying that process of applying the method to the specific problem. Nice. Um, you mentioned EMDR, and I actually have a lot of clients who have been asking about that um, in the last like year and a half. It's become a a bigger thing. It's not you know super mainstream right now, but it has um, a lot of psychologists and life coaches. They're being asked by their clients, like, "What is EMDR? How does it work?" And they're getting very hopeful. Can you kind of explain what that process is and how it works? Yeah, so the EMDR is eye movement reprocessing and desensitization. So um, Francine Shapiro developed this, I think, back in the 70s, maybe. So uh, 70s or 80s. And what she, she was a psychologist and she was walking in the woods and she realized that she felt better when she got back from walking in the woods and she was trying to understand why. And over time, she began to um, connect that with eye movements, so scanning the horizon, so going back and forth, because when we're in the woods, we're actually prey, right? Uh, we have the potential to be prey, so we have to be on alert, and we have to kind of scan the horizon. <clears throat> and she then kind of began to associate that with sleep or with rapid eye movement because that's what happens when we're sleeping our eyes are flickering back and forth in REM sleep 
And what's happening is you might have had that experience of waking up feeling better than when you went to sleep or going to bed with a problem, and then your brain solves the problem overnight. And what happens when we experience trauma, especially when our brains aren't fully developed, is that it gets stuck in our nervous system, like it doesn't get processed, it doesn't connect all the circuits in our brain. And whenever we see the trigger, and that could be like a smell or a taste or a sense or, a, or just a feeling that comes up and it overwhelms us, that comes out of our nervous system. So with EMDR, with the eye movements or with tapping, we're, we're doing a bilateral stimulation. We're integrating the two hemispheres of the brain and we're bringing that memory, that traumatic memory back into consciousness and processing that in a safe and gentle way. So we're integrating the memories that we have around that uh, traumatic experience with the feelings that you have in your body now with the memory, with the current date, and those things kind of come together <clears throat> during the EMDR process, which is um, a little bit like hypnosis. We do rounds of eye movements and then tell me what you notice. The memories tend to flush out and memories come up that you may not have realized were there. And then they, they kind of like consolidate those memories with that physical feeling and it or as we desensitize the body through that process, <clears throat> the memory then gets associated with a feeling of calm and kind of reconstitutes and gets stored in a way that is much less triggering to us and we get a better yeah. understanding of what happened. So you feel better almost immediately and then that uh, adaptive information process that the brain does while you're sleeping that kind of continues over time, even after just one session. And the research shows that that is pretty solid. Once you consolidate that memory, it doesn't go back to the old thing. You might get triggered again, but it, it's um, much less and kind of allows you to stay within your window of tolerance. So hopefully that's a good description. Yeah, that, that was actually a very good description. I've also heard it for some people who are not, um, what's the, the word, um, have a little bit difficulty understanding a scientific process um, with all of the big words and everything. I've heard it described as, and I've actually experienced this myself because I've done EM, EMDR, um, where it's processing a memory that is associated with a flashback without getting pulled into the flashback. So you're still here in the present moment and you're processing it. It turns it in from a flashback into a memory that you can process, like you said, in a safe place, but without getting drawn into that flashback. Because we all have experienced this when we get drawn into a flashback. We are, you know, five, six, seven, 12 years old. Um, we are in that position again in that situation and our bodies are reliving the visceral sensations of that flashback it's not a memory it's you are drawn back in time and you still feel that exact same way and that is a very scary i mean imagine being you know five six years old and in a traumatic situation or however old you may have been and not knowing how to deal with it and you're just reliving that moment over and over and over again you know, you were just as scared when you were six as you are now because that part of you is going to get into our, you know, next question. That part of you is still that age that the traumatic event happened. And that's what a flashback is. So EMDR kind of stops that drawing you back into the flashback and allows you, allows you to view it as an adult, which regulates the nervous system and calms it down. Is that about, you know, a simplified version of no, I, I, for sure. And, and um, one thing that you have to be careful of is we test, test for dissociation beforehand, before we uh, do the process, because people can get stuck and we want to make people feel comfortable and safe, even if they're having a traumatic experience. So one thing we can do is limit the time that we, uh, 
client spends in that state. So we can say, hey, you know, could you just look at this from, from the side? Could you look at this from, from behind? Could we just look at this for five seconds? Would that be too much? Well, how much time would be enough to just get the picture of that? And then we process smaller bits and pieces of that so that people don't fall into the memory and get stuck or lost and have to be brought back out. And I've actually had that experience before where we had to, um, I had to bring somebody back out of that where they kind of felt trapped in their experience. Uh, so doing more research and learning how to provide smaller bites of that experience so that people don't get fall into it. You can yeah. imagine like falling into the memory or falling into the scene and then having everything come up and then flashing right back to it. And then, okay, all that fear and trauma and anxiety comes right up. Um, so we don't want to overwhelm the client and put them into overwhelm. That's not the idea. Yeah. I, this is kind of a side note, but I absolutely love um, understanding people's visceral experience of what's going on. Like the, uh, the imagery when you're saying, oh, falling into the memory, getting drawn into the flashback. It, it uh, describes a visceral experience that is unlike, I mean, it, the only other time that I've heard people experience this is when they are on like hallucinogenics. And they're like, oh yeah, all, all this crazy stuff happening. I was here and I was doing this. But this is a completely, um, I guess I can't say it's a completely drug-free because our brain produces chemicals and drugs that probably play into this. But it's a sober version of having that visceral experience. And it is crazy how many people, this is the only way they know how to describe it. When I say things like, do you feel like you're falling into the memory? Do you feel like you're being drawn back into this flashback? And they can say yes. But if you ask them, are you having a flashback? They can't answer. They don't know until you say, well, does it feel like you're falling into it? Or do you feel like you're being drawn into it? Then they can relate those visceral sensations with the experience that's going on. And that's a fascinating um, part of this process that I have personally experienced and that I have experienced with a bunch of clients. So Yeah, yeah. And if you, I, I imagine a, like a, like a graph that has like big spikes up, big spikes spikes down. And in the middle is like our window of tolerance where we operate comfortably, uh, efficiently, and we're engaged. We're not engaging our uh, four Fs, fight, flight, fawn, or freeze, right? We're just operating comfortably. We're making progress in life and we're feeling good. And then something comes up and we spike up, right? And we get our fight. Or flight, so we're we're running, or we spike down. We get our freeze or, or our fawn, and the idea that if we can notice when that happens and recognize how we feel in our body when those spikes happen, we can process that through counseling or through self work, or through self care, to keep ourselves more often in that window of tolerance. Because it's no fun to live in the spike environment, right? The crisis lifestyle, though, it's. It's drama that we, we have in our body. Sometimes we create it for ourselves and sometimes we get like addicted to it because that's comfortable for us. That's yeah. how we were raised. That's what we remember. And maybe sometime later when, as we recognize that, hey, that might be an issue for me. I don't want to live like that anymore. Uh, let's make some changes. It's at that point where people want to change that you can have impact or positive effect, but trying to change people when they, before they've come to that point, we're trying to change them from externally offering advice or um, trying to change people that you care about because you see they're hurting. It, it's really ineffective unless people come and ask for it. Uh, yeah. you, you, you might've had the experience of having a nosy relative give you advice. Nobody likes that. Right? It's the same with a counselor. Nobody, you know, some, some people <clears throat> actually, they do come and they ask for advice, but the solution has to come from the person internally. Otherwise it's not their solution, right? And you're bound to yeah. get it wrong. wrong. <clears throat> so the idea is that 
we're just facilitating and acting as a guide on the journey to healing for people. Mm -hmm. They find their own way. We're just keeping them, helping them stay, get into that window of tolerance so that they can understand and develop themselves. I feel like this is a common struggle for anyone who wants to do life coaching or therapeutic, you know, stuff is the desire to fix people because we all kind of have a savior complex where we, we love helping people so much and it means so much to us. And that's not a bad thing. However, if it means that much to you, sometimes you can be like the helicopter parent over a client and be like, well, you should do this and you should do this. And here's how you fix all your problems. And (laughs) you end up pushing the client away um, because like you said, sometimes people come and ask for help. Um, Sometimes they're not ready for it. They they want help, but they're not willing to do the work for that. And I've I've encountered that quite a bit. But then there's this, this specific kind of client who wants help, they're willing to do it, but on their terms. And those I find that I really have to struggle with my savior complex. Like I can't save this person. I can't fix it for them, but I can be here to help facilitate them on how to figure it out themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, No, I I liken it to, hey, you know, just because we have a different point of view, we can see that maybe sticking your hand in the alligator's mouth is not a good idea. And they're like, but I love the alligator. It's my friend. And, and every time, you know, they're so nice to me and they, you know, they say they're going to be nice this time. And the, the alligator is, is cute and, and I'm used to it. And when it bites me, you know, it feels bad for a minute, but then there, it feels so good to go back to the alligator. It's like, well, you know, your, your inclination is, to give them advice, right? Do not stick your hand in the alligator's mouth. But yeah. it's so hard. They have to make that decision. They have to come to that realization on their own. They have to decide that they don't want to stick their hand in the alligator's mouth. Not because they don't like them, but because it's causing damage to them. Yeah. They have, that is the key point. They have to acknowledge that something is causing damage to them, even if they love it. And that is a hard position to be in where you don't think that you should loving something and it causing you damage consciously, irrationally, those don't mix. Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. Like, no, you're you're loving something should never cause you damage. And while that is true, it shouldn't, but it does sometimes. Sometimes we love things that cause us damage. And unless we acknowledge that it's causing damage that we're not willing to handle anymore. We don't, we don't progress from that point. Yeah, that's kind of a good time to do a cost benefit analysis, which is really simple, right? You just draw a T and you're like, what are the costs of doing this? What are the benefits? And actually writing it down helps people see it better because then it's in their face and they're coming up with the costs and benefits. You're not coming up with it. And then you can actually score those costs and benefits and come up with a total at the bottom. And now, you know, they can still ignore that. They can still decide, but they've gone through the exercise and it's kind of plain as day and they're making the conscious decision. So it comes to consciousness. It's not unconscious that this thing may not be good for you. Yeah. So, um, we were talking, uh, when we were talking about the flashbacks of EMDR, mm-hmm. um, I had mentioned parts, and yeah. before that you had mentioned ISS, or ISS. Um, oh, there's a Freudian slip right there, you know, ISS <laughs> in school suspension. Uh, <laughs> maybe I got some things I need to work on. <laughs> so, um, my next question was going to be, are you familiar with ISS or parts therapy? And you kind of indicated that you were. Um, I was wondering if you could kind of explain that briefly for people who don't mm-hmm. understand IFS or have never even, they don't know what it is. Yeah, IFS is um, really parts-based therapy developed by Richard Schwartz, uh, founder, and he's pretty dynamic and he's out there in the public a lot and they have a, a really nice organization with training. I've done a little bit of training, but the 
the general idea is that we are all made up of parts and there are no bad parts. And they kind of classify them in a set of categories that, and this makes a lot of sense to me and may make sense to you as well, that it, there's a self part, which is kind of the core of who we really are and we want to be. And that's who we are when we're, we're relaxed and we're feeling good and there's no pressure and we're not self-conscious and we're just in the flow and we're doing our thing. And then there are a set of exiles and those are related to trauma. So we have trauma and it creates a part of us that splits off and has to be kept in a dark room or in a closet or in a cave somewhere. And, and it's always kind of there bubbling under the surface. And it's so frightening that we don't want it to come out. So we have a set of managers who manage our emotions and our actions and our interactions and our relationships to, to defend the exiles, to keep them from being trotted out. Because what happens when that happens is we spike our, we're triggered, we spike when we get triggered, the exiles is, is coming up or coming to the forefront or coming out of the closet or coming out of the cave or unleashed, it comes right into our face and we're like, that is too frightening. Uh, that's my exile. So I'm gonna get my, my firefighter part comes out and says, we need to hose that down. We need to put that thing back in the cage. We need to ignore that thing. We need to do the, the four Fs. We're gonna fight that thing. We're gonna flee from it. We're gonna fawn over it or we're gonna freeze and hope that it doesn't notice us. So the firefighter comes out and a lot of times the fighter, fighter, firefighter is self-destructive or relationship destructive or uh, not real good at being in the world uh, with other people. And it could, could be uh, that, that we engage in alcohol or drugs or self-harm or other things that the firefighters bring out but really it's it's kind of like a in the um, nvc terms like a tragic expression of unmet needs right it, it's something that is not helpful but it solves the immediate problem even if it creates another set of problems that i have to solve so it becomes a cascading type issue so the idea with internal family systems is to be able to integrate all the parts into self so that none of them have to feel split off and having enough self energy so that we can address the exiles and we can integrate them and bring them back into the family um, so that they're not out there. They are a part of us. There are no bad parts. It's just a piece that got broken off at some point and maybe need some care. So the method is to invite the parts to the table and try to have the manager or the firefighter, well, firefighters, we hope to stay away while we're having this discussion, <laughs> but uh, you know, invite the manager to step back and let the self come out and then begin to integrate exiles over time. And um, really, that isn't is impossible without a good relationship with your counselor. And that's one of the things I wanted to bring up about finding a counselor is that there's some huge percentage of, of effectiveness of counseling. It's based on the relationship with the counselor. Mm -hmm. So if you have an issue or you can't get around or you don't feel right, then you need to find somebody else because it's something like 70% of the effectiveness of counseling is related to the relationship that you form with the counselor. And that's not saying that, you know, it has to always be great and that you're not going to be challenged by the counselor uh, to look at some things that are difficult. If it's always comfortable, then you're not making any progress. So um, having that parts come out, being comfortable, and typically we would do that in a, like a kind of a meditative state where we take a couple deep breaths, close our eyes and invite the people to the table, the parts, and then we begin to hear from them and try to integrate them 
back into the hole. And it's kind of reminds me of the EMDR process when you get down to it and you're processing the trauma because sometimes we will go with a part back to the child part and try to understand that event from a strong adult healthy point of view and have a conversation with the child or the person who or the part that was traumatized in that time in the past so that the person can get like a dual view you can see it from outside you can see it from inside and then we begin to integrate those things so that the the tension and the physical trauma and the physical triggering can dissipate and you can see that event in a new light with an integrated set of parts and with yourself so that you're not run by those things on your, di on your daily life. You can act in the world as you want to and not be run by things that have happened in the past. Yeah. So that actually brought up a question that um, I didn't have on the document or anything, but it just kind of brought it up. Um, I've heard that uh, like between the two methods, IFS and EMDR, um, you mentioned IFS requires a good, solid, trusting relationship with your therapist or your coach or whoever is mm -hmm. providing the structure. Um, however, EMDR, I've heard that it can be done without as strong of a trusting bond with uh, a counselor. Um, I'm not sure if that requires like some uh, mental or emotional fortitude on the person who is engaging, like using the process, um, or if it can even be done like just by yourself. But that was a really interesting um, bit of information about EMDR that I was not aware of. I'm not really sure. I don't think I have a question about that. It was just something. Ha have you encountered that? Um, I, there's two things in there that I heard you say that maybe you can do EMDR without the, the trusting, empathetic relationship. And I, I think that could be true. But it's I'm trying to think of an analogy or a metaphor. Um, you know, it's kind of like, uh, yeah, I, I can, you know, if I, I'm running a race and I'm wearing, uh, old shoes and I'm carrying a, a weight, right. I still might be able to win or do well, but certainly if I had some really good shoes and I wasn't carrying a, a weight, I'd have a better chance of, of achieving my goal. So I think it's similar with EMDR in that. Having that relationship allows people to, to express where their trauma comes from. Uh, because if you don't trust the counselor or the coach or therapist, then it's very difficult for you to expose things that maybe cause so much triggering. It could be embarrassment, it could be shame, it could be um, fear right so expressing those things in front of somebody who you're not comfortable with it's difficult no matter what method you're using so i would say that you know while it's possible it's not preferred and then also emdr uh francine shapiro had written a couple books on self-care using emdr so you can use that by yourself <clears throat> and i think that it's they have a past focus and a present focus and a future focus and i think that for the present and for the future that that's kind of like coaching and you can set yourself up for success in situations where you're not entirely comfortable by going through the self-care emdr process and kind of flushing out some of those uncomfortable feelings doing a rehearsal, going into the scene and having it happen exactly how you want to happen, um, a little bit like hypnosis. And mm -hmm. if you're 
going to be bringing up really challenging triggers or feelings, it's best to do that in the presence of a trained counselor so that <clears throat> you don't get yourself in a situation that's detrimental or harmful or, or so triggering that you can't get out of it. So you want to guide that understands where you're going and can keep you out of that kind of trouble. Yeah. I was thinking um, the, the reason that that seems like a uh, positive, or it could be positive, is I know that there's a lot of clients who have had a, um, the problem is humans have, most of their trauma is interpersonal trauma. Uh, of course, we have people who um, were attacked by a dog or, you know, they got hit by a car. They were in some sort of accident that mm -hmm. didn't necessarily have to deal with people. But a yeah. lot, especially a lot of complex post-traumatic stress um, happens through interpersonal relationships and therefore developing a trusting relationship with another human being, which is why animals are often used in therapeutic settings, because it's a safer bond than with a human. Um, that's why I was so intrigued by the possibility that, you know, there may be some treatments out there that could be used um, with just yourself or that you could maybe find someone that you're relatively okay with, but you, you, you struggle to maintain that trusting bond with another human being, that there might be options out there for people like that who are, you have to take very, very small baby steps. Um, when it comes to building that trusting relationship. So I thought that maybe I was like, oh, that would be um, a possibility for people like that. Um, that's the only reason I brought it up. But I, of course, I do agree that if you can find someone that you can build even the slightest bit of a trusting relationship with, um, you should definitely move towards that. That is always preferred to have a guide. Yeah. Yeah, and um, I think some of the things you mentioned like go to self-care and you know, really it's difficult to trust yourself when you're feeling like that but you actually have the solutions within yourself and it's possible to bring them out through different methods or learning and, and it just depends on what's your inclination are you able to do it safely do you need immediate help? Are you in crisis? Is this, is this a lifelong journey or is it, I need a spot fix? Uh, do I need to stay out of the hospital? Do I, do I have thoughts of self-harm? <clears throat> Those things have to be mitigated as fast as, as you can, right? Yeah. But the, the learning to take care of yourself and learning to be more effective, to be more comfortable, to be more yourself, that can happen over your lifetime and making that a priority is um, something that people don't really do, right? They don't think about it. And I like to think about it as, hey, when you run into somebody who feels really good and they look good and they treat you well and you can tell that they feel good about themselves, that's the kind of person that makes you feel good and you want to be around, right? So they're actually giving you a gift by feeling well themselves and taking care of themselves and looking good. They're, they're giving that gift to other people. So working on yourself is not really selfish, is it, right? You're, you're actually giving that gift to others as you give it to yourself. So it's a, it's a mutual benefit situation. And that's what we want to get into where, hey, we're just making the pie bigger and um, you know, I don't have to take from anybody. I can pour skills and abilities and comfort and love into myself. And the act of doing that is actually loving the people around me. Yeah, absolutely. That actually goes back to um, a word definition comparison. For, that's the best way that I know how to explain that. But um, a lot of people, I feel like, use the word selfish interchangeably with self-centered. And when I tell people about um, heart therapy or IFS is that your parts, except for self, are all selfish. Or sorry, they're all self-centered. They are centered around self. 
-hmm. that is their main priority that is their only priority is maintaining self maintaining you as a person however being selfish is working on those parts using them to um integrate your system and as a part of the team utilizing not using utilizing these individual parts for the betterment of self which helps you interact with the world around you because one of my favorite um analogy maybe that's not the right word but it was talking about how um you have an angry part you know you have self that loves your children you know but you got like a four-year-old and they really wanted to express their self into their, their independence and they decided to pull the gallon of milk out of the fridge and dump it into a glass and they spill the milk all over the floor mm -hmm. and you don't have any money to buy more milk you'd have you know stuff that you had planned for that and now you've got a huge mess to clean up and the way that this person explained it was self loves your children but your angry part the part who is defending you they don't care that part is only for you so if you allow your angry part to speak on your behalf they're not going to speak to your child with love and understanding and compassion because they don't that's not their job that's self job so that's why uh ruling with self energy is so important because self is the one who is not self-centered so yeah there's a little bit of a tirade, not a tirade, a little bit of a rant about like defining words in this process is very important to me because we don't realize the implications um, or the assumptions that we have tied to specific words. Yeah, no, I like that idea that <clears throat> acting from self is acting the way that you would if you could choose. And when your firefighter or your anger part comes out, if you looked at that in retrospect, would you want to choose that? And yeah. the idea of healing or being better is that you're creating a buffer in that trigger zone where you have time to act the way that you want to act instead of uh, striking, right? You, you put that thinking between the stimulus and the response and I like to imagine that you're creating a, a bubble of self, of self-efficacy of self around you, like a force field. And then when things bump up against your force field, you can decide like what comes in and what you keep external and then how you react to those things. <clears throat> so having a mental model is great putting it into practice on a day-to-day -day basis when the triggers come up is a lot harder. So hard. <laughs> right? But just imagine what superpower you would have if you were able to do that. And it's very attractive to be able to do that. And that's what, when you see somebody who can do that, um, you know that they're taking care of themselves and they're also taking care of the people who are, who are triggering them. Uh, at the same mm -hmm. time so yeah so my next question was um within like part therapy and ifs there's that there's part dynamics there's parts that interact with specifically other parts and one of the favorites of mine is the firefighter and exile dynamic this uh combination of the firefighter is the protector and the jailer yes of an exile Yep. And I, I am very fascinated with that, di that dynamic. And it made me wonder, um, do other counselors have a favorite part dynamic that they really, that their parts really enjoy working with? <laughs> yeah, I, that's a really like challenging question for me. Um, I, I think that, you know, I have a natural aversion to the firefighter, so that makes it hard for me. And when the firefighter comes up, I have kind of like, like a like a calm freeze or a flight response to that in a lot of cases. And uh, if the fight response comes out, then you know it's really bad, right? Within the firefighter, so that's that's one part that I 
have a challenge with and need to work on, right? It's how do I respond to other people's firefighters? And, and then I'm kind of like, I'm a manager myself. So I, I'm inclined to manage, <clears throat> but I have a lot of empathy for the exiles. So I like working with the exiles. The thing is you can't go to the exiles without permission from the managers. And yep. so you have to work with all the parts to get to the nitty gritty exile. And there's something about freeing the exile that is like a heroic journey for the client and also for the counselor. So that's what I enjoy, right? When you see that exile come out and be free, um, it's like a, it's like insight or enlightenment and knowing that they don't have to ever have to go back in the cage is uh, just a beautiful moment, right? People have those. And so that's what I, I like witnessing that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So the next couple of questions are mostly about like, um, clients in particular um for example well actually no we're gonna we're gonna start with the one about you um what kind of techniques do you use for your personal self to manage your stress levels and your discomfort on a day-to-day -day basis is there yeah. anything that you use oh absolutely i mean self-care is really important for everybody and um i mean i kind of have a set of routines that I have adapted and occasionally I'll, I'll add something. Um, and some of them are like disciplines, but some of them are um, just things that I recognize as self-care during the, the day. And so one thing that I do is, you know, before I go into some kind of a situation, I, I will, try to get myself in the frame for that. So that might be like driving somewhere 15 minutes early and doing a short meditation or a hypnosis on stress relief or confidence or uh, empathy or um, just to get myself in the right frame of mind to bring everything I can to that situation. I actually do that on a daily basis. So a little bit of meditation or hypnosis. Another thing I'll do is when I'm, when I'm distracted and I have to get some things done, uh, I will, I'll play frequency tones in my earbuds. And I find that that allows me to focus to a much greater degree. And even if I'm half the battle is just getting started on these tasks that are mundane or, or you have some anxiety about. So being able to get into a comfortable state put on some frequency or tone or some light uh, classical music or something, really, the, I like the frequencies, then two hours can go by and I, I will have accomplished more than I thought possible just getting in that focus zone. Then there's some grounding techniques and then um, exercise, hobbies, relationships, talking with my wife, walking the dog. Uh, the dog is a source of endless positive regard. So that's really nice. And just trying to be aware on a daily basis of what when those triggers are coming up, what are they? And then trying to process those things using that meditation or uh, a little bit of self EMDR as well. So yeah, so there's a lot of things and I don't do all that stuff every day, but I do have do have a pretty good routine going. And really, it's designed, again, to keep me in my window of tolerance and to be able to approach difficult situations in a frame of mind where I'm choosing um, and to, yeah, to try to bring my best to my own life and to others, as we discussed. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's not easy. But it is a practice and set of practices that are readily available and anybody can do 
and it actually feels good. So, uh, and it doesn't, it's not related to self-harm or, or firefighters or other things like we can choose to do these things that feel good and are good for us at the same time. And once you start to build some momentum, <clears throat> you build some nice healthy habits, you see what impact that has on yourself and the people around you. It kind of takes on its own momentum or positive spiral. And that's, that's the idea. Yeah. And you know, you're going to fall off the train every now and then and things are going to hurt and you're going to be hurt by things. Uh, but knowing that you can, you've been in that zone before for a long period of time and you can get yourself back to it is really kind of comforting. Um, and yeah. you know, it's not always the same thing that brings you back into the zone. So you have to like, fiddle with the knobs and the controls, uh, to get yourself there and, and it changes over time because life changes, we change. So the things that you do or practice will change and grow over time. That's actually why I like the metaphor of the coping skills toolbox. And actually I'm in the process of um, publishing a small self-help guide filled with a lot of these tips and techniques that you can use to day-to-day -day, um, manage your stress levels. But the reason I like the metaphor of the toolbox is you have this box of tools. Now you can use the hammer or you can use the screwdriver or you can use the pry bar and that can be your go-to. But if something isn't working right at that moment, you can put that tool back in the toolbox, grab another one, and then whenever you need the first one that you, you can go back and get that one. Like you don't have to, a lot of people, they pick up a tool and they're like, oh, this isn't working for me. <laughs> right, just right. toss that out um, like meditation for me for the first year and a half to two years of this process it didn't work for me it was very frustrating it left me in a worse state than you know not trying to meditate um i'm not gonna remember to pick up that card later uh <laughs> but um and i would just toss it out the window i just you know, throw it away, like, oh, this technique doesn't work for me. And then finally, after like two years in, I was like, okay, let me, let me go back. Let me gather up all these tools that I've thrown everywhere. Let me go buy the new ones that I threw in the trash. Let me replace these and let me just keep them in a box here. And whenever I feel like I need a tool, I'm going to rummage through this box. I'm going to pick out one. And if it doesn't work, I'm going to put it back in the toolbox. I'm going to find another one. I'm going to see if that one works. And just keeping that toolbox of things that you can use. I think that is a, a better method for me and for many people, because it's so easy to just want that quick fix and just be looking for the solution at the time and then never really implementing that solution in the future because it didn't work for you that day. Yeah, yeah. I like that idea of like building skills as tools and every tool is not going to work in every situation, but the more breadth you have of skills, the more situations you're going to be able to manage and handle with, with grace. Yeah. And if you don't practice, then it's not going to be there for you when you need it. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. If you're, you know, if you're, you know, you might have to sprint away from a bear in the woods if you don't practice your sprinting every now and then, <laughs> right? You're just going to exactly. get what you get. That's another aspect of this. Um, a lot of clients think that the, the sprinting away, the fighting, the freezing, the folding, that all of these coping mechanisms are inherently bad. And that's, that's not actually true. If you are being chased by a panther, you bet your ass it's a good tool to have to know how to run away from the situation. You're going to need that adrenaline. You're going to need to know how to do that. And that's what our, our minds and our bodies have provided for us. It is there so that we can maintain safety. And so the, the real hard part is understanding that 
these are tools that are meant to be used in life or death dire situations. So if you're using a situation, if you're using a coping mechanism like this, your, your mind and your body believe that you are in a life or death situation. Now, if it's obvious that you aren't, you need to understand where that came from. For instance, uh, abandonment is a, is a big confusing one for people because they're like, I'm not going to die if I'm abandoned. I'm not going to die if people leave me. And I say, but where did you learn this? Did you learn it when you were very, very young? Okay, what does abandoning a baby do? What is the outcome? If you were to take a baby, and this is horrific to imagine, so it's, and I give them that, you know, little trigger warning, like this is horrific to imagine, but just sit with me for a second. Imagine that there's like a two-year-old baby and someone just takes it out and leaves it outside. And never comes back for it. No one ever comes and picks it up. No one ever, you know, takes care of it. What ha What is going to happen to that baby, realistically? There's a good chance that that baby might die. Very good chance. So, depending on when we learned these coping mechanisms and when we started utilizing them, you could be having a flashback to a literally life or death situation, even though you are not currently in a life or death situation. And that makes it very confusing for clients to understand why they're reacting the way that they're acting. Is this rational um, or is it irrational? Are they crazy? Are they just too sensitive? And it like, it reinforces this. Well, I shouldn't be having this problem to begin with. This part of me is bad. Well, that tool and that part was totally appropriate in the moment, right? Because it was a life or death situation. So when you, you know, you see a, what looks like a bear to you, you're going to run or fight and or freeze, right? And it's going to be the maximum that you can put out against that threat. The thing is that when you're an adult and most likely you see that situation again, you have a different set of tools that you can apply to the problem and let, and recognizing that that's just a memory or that's just a trigger. It's not really a bear, right? You just <clears throat> went to the same place in the woods or you, you smelled the, uh, same smell or you're just in a similar situation recognizing that you're an adult or you're you have a different set of capabilities and tools that you can apply so you don't have to go into overdrive firefighter mode uh, to slay that thing uh, or be hyper vigilant against that threat on a day-to-day -day basis um, and that's a big challenge when it's burnt into your nervous system yeah Absolutely. Um, what, what do you most commonly see um, from clients who come in? Like, what are the most common problems that you encounter? Yeah, I, I guess, you know, anxiety and depression, of course, and grief. Um, social anxiety has been pretty big. Uh, and I mean, there is a wide range of things that people want help with. Uh, but I guess it comes down to, like, how do you manage yourself in these situations? And there's a lot of relationship challenges, and relationships then relate back to self. And how do we manage the situations and act in these in, within these patterns that we've established over decades or a lifetime? that are not effective for us. And, but those express themselves in different ways, right? Like could be addiction, could be self-harm, um, could be that anxiety, depression, or paranoia, or, or really these, they're negative thoughts. And so there, people have a big inner critic part that if we can make that inner critic part into an advocate, then things will change quickly. Yeah. And for people with like depression and anxiety and grief, um, I'm glad you mentioned that one because that wasn't um, one that I had automatically, you know, come up with. Um, but what would you suggest for anyone dealing with these things? 
um, do like make changes in their life to improve their quality of life? Like what are the basic things that you can do regardless of your situation to help? Yeah, <clears throat> we'll change. And really that's what, what we're talking about is change is a process and it doesn't happen overnight most of the time. And it can be challenging and difficult. Just taking the first couple steps, like if somebody comes to counseling, that's a huge step uh, because that's their first acknowledging that they have something that they want to work on. So that is really step number one is, you know, where does this, what is this thing that is disturbing my life? Can we identify that thing effectively first? And once you identify that, then you can begin to use techniques or methods or educate yourself on building the skills to solve that problem or, or to make it better. And that could be a wide range of interventions from you can do it yourself to we can do it with any one of these methods, but building that trusting relationship with somebody provides an environment where these things can come out and difficult things can be processed. And letting people know that it is a process, there's not a huge quick fix, and they're going to have to do the work. It's not like I can't inject you with the solution. You have to build that and bring it out from within yourself. Uh, it would be so nice if that was, you know, I, I cannot wait for the future because maybe we'll just have like a, everything's good. You're good now. <laughs> and just, you know, full reset. Let's, let's start over. That would be so nice. And I think that's, um, sadly, I think it's the idealistic dream when you're coming into this is like, this is the solution. If I can just implement this one thing, if I could just take my vitamin D and my yeah. vitamin D and yeah. go sit out in the sun for 10 minutes every day, everything's going to be fine. <laughs> yeah. We're going to just take this $100 bill and we're going to grind it up and then we're going to put some honey and orange juice on it. And if you swallow this thing, everything's going to be fine. Yep. <laughs> yeah, not so much. No, it's, it's a challenge and it's, it's a change and growth. It doesn't have to be difficult, but it really depends on how you look at it. And again, yeah. having that safe relationship and environment to grow within and to fail, right? You have to be, it has to be okay to fail, which we always taught is not okay. Um, you just kind of fail your way forward and making that space, letting people be vulnerable in that space, sitting in there with them. They, they just tend to like, understand that there's somebody that has their back. And maybe that's the first time in their life that that's happened. And once they get that realization, it makes it much easier to work on themselves or make problems or be vulnerable or fail the way forward. And that's an yeah. environment that we all kind of need to make progress. So kind of what I'm getting as a general answer to this question is um, start with your support system, start with building relationships and learning how to develop a, just a, even a small sense of trust with yourself and other people. Is that correct? Yeah, that's really, really helpful to have somebody to trust or to have a support system and it's dangerous to be alone, to be alone or try to do it yourself. That doesn't mean that you don't make an effort by yourself on different things and try to learn and put things into practice, but it does help to have like feedback. So we're not just throwing these things out into nowhere, we're getting some feedback and, and some results that we can then make adjustments to and improve. The way I like to think about this is um, the ultimate task of healing is 
similar to like a giant boulder on the bottom of a hill. And your job is to push this boulder to the top of the hill. Okay. Well, you're the only person who can touch the boulder. You're the only person who can push it up physically. You have to do it by yourself. You have to be the one to do it. However, you're going to be more likely to accomplish your task if you have people on the sidelines going, you got it, Tim. We, we believe in you. Here, here's some rope. Maybe you can pull it up. You know what? That's not working. Here's some water. Take a break. Have a drink. Have some food. We believe in you. Every, you know, like you have a support system who are throwing ideas at you, um, supporting you, acknowledging that yes, you're you're exhausted right now, and I totally believe in you. Here's some something to you know stop the boulder from rolling back so you can take a break you know that's your support system and you're more likely to get to the top of that hill with that support system than you are going to be doing it all by yourself but ultimately you have to push that boulder to the top of the hill you have to do it no one else can do it for you and that is super daunting and intimidating for a lot of people because they don't have a support system which leads me into my last question, and it's actually one of the most important ones. It's the one that I have not really been able to provide a structure or an answer um, that I am fully satisfied with for a lot of my clients, even myself and uh, my friends and loved ones. And that would be how does someone who's lacking a support system begin to rebuild one? How do you, where do you start with that? Yeah, oh, I think that's a tough one um, because people they have trouble being vulnerable or because they've been hurt in the past. And when you can get a little sense of self and stand on that, then it becomes more comfortable to be vulnerable with others and that's how you connect. So what what in what ways can we connect or be vulnerable with other people and be comfortable with that? Well, maybe offering your services or reaching out, making offers to people to connect, recognizing that not everybody's going to want to accept that or, or connect in the way that you want to, right? But being okay with that, like being okay with failing in relationships or failing in and it's almost like ex- you, there's a negative connotation to exposure therapy, but it does work. So let's say that we said, okay, as part of your connection treatment, you have agoraphobia, you don't want to go out of the house. You know, the first thing is, would you be comfortable sitting on the front steps? And, and, yeah. Or would you be comfortable like walking up to the front door and thinking about going outside? What would what's the smallest thing that you would be willing to do and then we just try to take the baby steps in that direction now as far as building a support system i i think that like having an internal support system is the most important thing and then once you're comfortable with yourself then things tend to begin to gravitate towards you because people are comfortable around you and they naturally want to be closer to that and support more of that. And <clears throat> I might be going off track a little bit, but all of us have sometimes this, we have this mirror that we look at as we are out in the world and our inner critic is on our shoulder as we both look in the mirror together and they're saying, this is what you did and this is what's wrong and this is what's bad, right? Well, as soon as you flip that mirror to the other person and begin reflecting, the beauty in the other people that are around you, there's nothing for the inner critic to latch on to and everything for everyone around you to latch on to. When you become interested in other people, you become the most interesting person in the world. That's how we talk about social anxiety um, that we're giving, we're not expecting. And that act of giving and not expecting, it's very attractive and Yes, you could still be hurt, but on balance and in general, 
you're going to get a much better result again being positive and giving than you would be in having the inner critic on your shoulder describing to you why you can't push that rock up the hill yeah that's a great way of putting that i like that so that was the that was all of my questions we got through everything and only took us a little less than an hour and a half that was <laughs> Also, a great conversation. I actually like. I was struggling so hard to stay on topic because I was like, "Oh, that that brings up another thing <laughs> that I'd like to talk about." This is the the whole process of psychology and you know our internal family system and the process of healing is just it's the reason I'm in it because it's fascinating to me. I enjoy learning more about myself, and it's it's a strange feeling to realize that you don't actually know the entirety of yourself because you have exiles and you have firefighters and managers and they don't always like each other. <laughs> and you have this shadow self of all of these qualities that you really, you know that you have, but you don't want to know that you have. So you kind of like shove them in the corner somewhere and like board up that wall. So you never <laughs> have to see it. Yeah. It's, it's fascinating to me. Well, uh just imagine how boring it'd be if everybody was perfect, right? And what would that mean, <laughs> right? So there's always something I to discover even, and work on. I can't uh, even imagine what that would be like. Like my brain just draws a blank. It's like, what? Huh? Yeah. No. No. But I, I so appreciate you setting this up. And I really love the way you think about things and appreciate you engaging me and forming up all the really good questions. It's a great discussion. And then having these discussions, that's one thing that <clears throat> I want to bring up as well before we close is that being an, being kind of introverted and being a kind of stay in the background person and think and being all, all like uh, logical, like you don't, you don't understand necessarily, or I didn't understand that speaking the words and, and having the conversation and putting the ideas out there and subjecting them to other people's thought processes, just that improves your quality of thinking and your relationships and being able to do that and being able to be a little bit vulnerable, uh, you get a much better result by having those discussions. So that's part of what therapy is about, like getting the words out, getting the thoughts out, getting them out on the table, reintegrating those things. Seeing if it makes sense. Does that make sense to other people? Uh, can they give you some feedback that helps you get a better result and think think more clearly or integrate those thoughts into your being or yourself? That talking process is really valuable. Uh, so I value our time together today. I'm, I'm very glad. That makes me very happy to hear. Uh, before we go, um, I wanted to give you a chance to uh, let people know if they want to get a hold of you, if they're interested in any of your services, um, how would they go about doing that? Yeah, so so I do, um, in Texas, I'm a licensed professional counselor associate. So I do licensed counseling in Texas, and then I do coaching for the broader global community. And you can reach me at tim.flynn at protonmail.com, or you can search me up on Psychology Today. It's Counselors in Texas. Awesome. Thank you, Willow. Thank you. It's been, it's been a great conversation.